Hey, it's Kay. And this is Skittles, Acoustical Engineer. Platforms like YouTube have kind of opened the floodgates in recent years, allowing more people than ever before to engage in the criticism and analysis of art. And while I think that's ultimately a very good thing, it has also meant that many old conflicts about how you should or shouldn't go about analyzing art that have been played out before behind the guarded gates of academia have been dragged up to be refought on this platform over countless response videos and epic takedowns. One of the questions at the center of these heated debates is often who decides what a text means. For the purposes of this video, when I say a text, I mean any work of art, whether recycled Hollywood trash or a novel or a video game, that work is the text. So, does the author have total dominion over their creation? Do they have the right to decide what the correct interpretation of a text is and dismiss other readings of their work as incorrect or not canon? After all, they wrote it, they know what they meant to say. Or does the audience decide what a text means? Are they permitted to put their own emotions and experiences into a text? If somebody tells you they find a song sad, but the musician did not intend it to be, is the listener wrong to be sad? Is the listener subordinate to the will of the songwriter, or do they decide what the piece means to them? I would caution against viewing this as a binary. Both of these are lenses that you can analyze a text with. Lenses are not correct or incorrect, they are simply different. You can discover different things in a work by looking into the author, who they are, what their intentions were, by applying an authorial lens. You can also untangle all sorts of ideas in a text by applying other lenses, perhaps a class lens or a feminist lens or a religious lens of some kind. All of these can transform the meaning of a text while being looked at through those lenses. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean every interpretation is just as well thought out, well evidenced, and coherent as any other. What it means is that you are not automatically right or wrong for applying any particular lens. But I want to go beyond that. I want to argue that the very application of lenses takes place in a context. I reject the binary decision of whether the author or the audience have the ultimate say over the meaning of a text because one does not stand above the other, but rather they are in conversation with each other. So, does that conversation take place in a vacuum? To hear many people discuss the intent of the author, you might be fooled into thinking that's the case. Pushing back against that idea, there is a famous essay written by Roland Barthes called The Death of the Author. For Barthes, the death of the author meant a criticism that denied the author the full authority over their text. Meaning that text was open to influence from external contexts, whether they came from the audience or the very conditions that the text exists in. In his essay, Barthes writes, The text is a tissue of citations resulting from a thousand sources of culture. Which is to say that the idea of the author as an all-knowing singular overseer of the text falls apart when you begin to understand the author as a person who exists within the cultural and material conditions of their time and place as an artist who is influenced by all that came before them. The words they write are not strictly their own, but are colored by their times and the entire historical context leading up to their present. 
Barthes ends his essay lamenting that in traditional literary criticism, the reader is a man without history, without biography, without psychology. He is only that someone who holds, gathered into a single field, all the paths of which the text is constituted. In other words, the reader is considered to exist in a vacuum, a featureless recipient of the text, with no context or perspective of their own influencing the work. But if we accept that the writer is a person, and they exist in a time and place influenced by the cultural and material conditions of that time and place, then we have to ask ourselves, is the reader a person? If the reader is a person, then we have to accept that they are also influenced by all of those same things in their own time and place. And if cultural and material conditions, if history can color and dictate the creation of a text, then surely they can affect the interpretation of a text. For example, there has long been debate over whether certain plays written by William Shakespeare are tragedies or comedies. How could two people watch the same play and come out of it with such a different impression of what they watched? Unless their experiences, their perception, colors the text itself. On an individual level, try to think of pieces of art that have taken on new meaning for you as times have changed. A favorite song, even if it's quite a happy one, if you share it with a loved one, it can become the saddest song ever written if they pass away. A movie about somebody losing their child might have done nothing for you when you were 16, but it could hit you like a truck if you watch it again as a 30-year-old parent. But let's go beyond individual experiences and into wider material conditions to really get to the heart of how the conditions that a text is created in and the conditions that a text is experienced in can dictate the meaning of that text beyond anything either the author or the audience decide for themselves. I want to explore this idea in direct response to an artist by the name of Robert Fripp. Robert Fripp, guitarist, songwriter, and founder of the band King Crimson, is a musician whose work I'm a very big fan of. But he is a notoriously brutal enforcer of copyright law. Fripp goes to great lengths to keep his music off of the internet, even going so far as to take down images of the album art from King Crimson Records. Fripp is determined to keep his music out of the hands of anyone who didn't buy the album or pay to see them play live. When justifying this aggressive copyright enforcement, Fripp does not cite lost revenue as his main motivation. Although that is certainly a factor, he disagrees with people experiencing King Crimson's music in anything but the intended experience, exactly as Fripp wants it to be. He believes that there is a correct way for the audience to experience his work, and he also believes that he can control and preserve that correct way. So let's get really specific. I want to talk about a favorite song of mine by King Crimson. Here's where I'd normally play a little bit of it for you, but as we've established, Fripp and his legal team would be all over me. And YouTube is not known for handling copyright issues particularly well. So, feel free to pause this video and go listen to it yourself if you aren't familiar. The song is called 21st Century Schizoid Man. We'll call it Schizoid Man for short. That's him right there, I'm pretty sure. The Schizoid Man. So we'll call the song Schizoid Man and this guy The Schizoid Man. It's not confusing at all, right? Good. I don't know about you, but when I see this guy, all I can think is... Same, buddy. Schizoid Man easily reads as an observation of the political climate in which it was written. In 1969, the height of the Vietnam War, the song laments the impact of what was going on in the world at the time, and it prophesizes, it fears that as a result of these conditions, the people of the next century will be, well, 
Schizoid men. Now, schizoid personality disorder is a real thing that real people live with, characterized by emotional detachment, apathy, and preoccupation with fantasy. Is this song suggesting we will all literally develop SPD in the 21st century? I don't think so, and that would be kind of absurd, and the way it uses the language of SPD to describe something that is ultimately different, but definitely bad, is pretty shit. It stigmatizes the mentally ill, and compares a societal condition to a psychological one. Which is important because what is affecting the schizoid man is man-made. So to understand this song, we have to draw a distinction between SPD and the condition affecting the schizoid man. I believe those symptoms are what schizoid man is really trying to warn us about. That the population will become detached, apathetic. Not because of a neurological condition, but because of our material conditions the environment we exist in. Schizoid man is immersed in the horror of the Vietnam War. In the first verse, we see allusions to the neurological damage of war. The PTSD suffered by countless American soldiers returning home from the war and Lord knows how many Vietnamese survivors. The paranoia of the Cold War that tore communities apart. This is the first few lines of the song. This is the state of the American political and social mentality already deteriorating as a result of the political climate being created during the Cold War as a direct result of US imperialism. In the second verse, we get even more specific. The use of napalm, barbed wire, directly conjuring images of atrocities committed in Vietnam. Innocence raped with napalm fire. Innocence is pronounced more or less the same as innocence. It's worth noting that the line works both ways. For a lot of people, Vietnam changed things. The image of America as the good guys who helped beat the Nazis was becoming impossible to maintain outside of the most fanatical circles. The reality of imperialism was becoming unavoidable. There was no more innocence, no more good old-fashioned values, because the death and destruction at the heart of our society was laid bare impossible to look away from. And in the third and final verse, we discuss the people more directly. The blind greed of the imperialists planting seeds of death as the Vietnam War claims millions of lives, most of them civilian. Poets starve as culture and the arts are devalued and pushed aside. Anything too difficult to commodify or that might be full of people opposed to the war is drowned out by the capitalist need to transform everything into a product that can be sold back to us. And to say children bleed almost feels like a comical understatement when discussing mass death on the scale of the Vietnam War. And that final line... The purest distillation of who the schizoid man is. Nothing he's got, he really needs. The post-war economic boom caused the American people and people throughout the West to some extent to develop a culture of consumerism. Nice cars, big houses, new TVs, the aspirations of regular people were increasingly being dominated by new forms of consumption. Now this would be a powerful piece of music to hear in 1969, echoing those concerns that must have been so present among those not swept up by the sound of America jingoistic war drums. This was a powerful song of political protest, of opposition to US imperialism, and a warning of what was to come. This is what Schizoid Man was in that time and that place. But to listen to it more than 50 years later, in 2020, it takes on an entirely different character. Schizoid Man ceases to simply be a political protest song a warning against capitalism and endless war. It becomes a piece of horror. It becomes the genuinely chilling experience of sitting in the future and listening to a voice from the past desperately pleading, stop this. Turn back or so many will die. Turn back or live in miserable apathy and alienation from the people around you.
And you can do nothing but listen helplessly to these warnings from the past, knowing they were right. Their worst fears and anxieties came to pass. We live in the world of the Schizoid Man. The US and other Western forces carve up and terrorize the planet in endless wars that claim countless lives every single year. Our culture becomes so hostile to anything and everything as the contradictions of class society become impossible to ignore. Mass shootings, terrorism, genocide, and starvation are so present in an endless stream of news that we just can't look away from until we, well, we just feel nothing. We dissociate, gliding out of our bodies as the unimaginable suffering of our world that we can broadcast directly into our homes 24-7 and just washes over us. No, we don't all have SPD, but the world schizoid man fears would come to pass. We live in it. And that is one of the most fascinating, terrifying, and beautiful things about art. When art is created, the world still moves around it. And that art does not stay static in one place forever. It changes too. It develops new meanings when it enters into new contexts. Which brings us back to Fripp and his obsession with listeners only experiencing his work as was intended. Looking at how Schizoid Man has evolved, has taken on new meaning, we start to see that Fripp's intended experience doesn't exist. The experience I get from listening to this song simply could not have been intended when it was written in 1969. The events of the past 50 years have created this experience every bit as much as the song itself has. And indeed, my own experiences and perspective have colored the song as well. What would I have gotten out of this song if I thought the Vietnam War was justified and US imperialism was hella based? It would be a different experience. 21st Century Schizoid Man is more than just the song Fripp wrote in 69. Nice. It's a text in conversation with its audience. And that conversation does not take place in a vacuum. It takes place at a given time, in a given place, influenced by the context created by the cultural and material conditions of that time and place. And if those conditions can transform the meaning of a song, imagine what else could be shaped by the conditions it exists in. Science? Philosophy? Your entire worldview? I mean, you and me both have ideas about what is normal, what is good and bad, but you didn't come up with all those ideas on your own, did you? I know I didn't. So, where do they come from? Fripp wasn't concerned that we'd all become alienated, apathetic consumers due to some personal failing, but because our environment would sculpt us into those things right under our noses. Nah, well, it's just a song, right? Bye-bye. <laughs> 